let all this expensive equipment fool you. I'm just an ordinary guy. But there's a difference. I'm on a mission. A mission to prove to you that time does not exist. And this is not an easy task. For example, take Professor Hawkins' mad scientist paradox. Professor Hawkins asked us to imagine what would happen if a mad scientist had a bed of radio diffusion constructed a powerful high-tech web. Then, with his gun completed, he walks the other side of a time portal. Assuming time exists, this device lets him see what is happening just 30 seconds in the past. So through the portal, he sees himself 30 seconds ago, preparing to construct the gun. And he shoots himself before he can construct the gun that he shoots himself with before he can construct the gun. So what is all this nonsense? Is this really a paradox that should give cosmologists like Stephen Hawking nightmares? Well, the answer is emphatic, no, because time does not exist, and only one man in the world can explain why, so please welcome real man. <laughs> Thank you, uh, thanks so much for being here. It's a real pleasure of being here. I am the real Matt Welcome. Uh, don't let that Lego character fool you. And please don't let all this expensive equipment fool you. Uh, I'm just an ordinary guy. Um, what is this talk about? How many people here have got a rough idea? Anyone who's got a rough idea? What about any, anyone who's at all interested in physics, stuff like that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yeah, about half the audience now leave me. Um, what's this all about? How it's up? I'll explain a couple of things to the end. There's a lot of slides in this talk. Um, I, quite, I got into PowerPoint a while back and I realised the internet is just like a, a massive collage making kit and just drag and drop, so I played a lot of slides. But I will explain every slide as they go along, so don't worry if I'm going too fast. As long as you listen to what I'm saying, uh, you'll be fine. Do come in, haven't missed much, just a very exciting animation. We've all stood up and said a little bit about ourselves and what Jesus means for us. So if you like to, it's all right if you didn't. This is the devil worship group. Um, take seats, these are the more comfortable ones over here, and I won't block you so much. Are you happy there? Are you happy there? Yes. Good, that's fine, that's fine. Um, what is this? Uh, what's it all about? It's uh, called A Brief History of Timelessness. It's about a book that I wrote and an idea that I had. This is the book that I wrote, I printed it out, it's about 500 pages uh, in total, quarter of a million, third of a million words. Um, and it all started when I had an idea that the world might be timeless. How did I get that idea? Well, one day I was having a very long, hot, relaxing bath. I had bars of like four or five hours long. If you've ever done that, really meditate in a really hot bath and top it up now and again and just chill out. And um, one day my mind kind of stopped. It was as if, as if a gas had become a liquid. It just kind of went joint down like that. It was as if there was a, a hoover that had been on for like 20 years and suddenly it had been turned off and everything was silent and still. And I started thinking, and it suddenly occurred to me that everything in the world and the entire universe, everywhere, there must be something happening, something moving, something changing. If you think about just the world, you know, every single bird that's in the sky must be moving, every part of it is moving constantly. Even an animal that's sleeping or grazing is moving, obviously an animal that run, is running is. Every drop of water in every ocean and every stream everywhere is moving all around the world. Out in space, you know, what look like star stars, tiny specks of light, are massive balls, and every part of that ball of fire is moving. Planets are orbiting their, their relative stars, or whatever. Our own sun is constantly burning tons and tons of fuel and converting it into energy. The earth is constantly spinning, and the wind is blowing the trees around and the blades of grass around. And even in our minds, we're constantly thinking, even if we're asleep. The world is full, the universe is full of constant change. And I was thinking, I'd like to see the sunset. I wonder when the sunset will be. And then it occurred to me that the sunset isn't really a time, it's a, a place. The sunset is here. I might well be in the bath here in London, but the earth is spinning, so I'm kind of heading towards the sunset. If I had a fast enough aeroplane, I could zip over there and look at the sunset. In fact, when Concorde was, was built and first flowing, they used to fly it from London to New York. They would fly into the sunset faster than the earth was spinning. So they made various stopovers. They would see the sun rise and sink and rise and sink. If they wanted, they could have chosen to just hang around here and stay in the sunset. The pilot and co-pilot having a very romantic tequila, doing you know, one point Mac, whatever. So 
that occurred to me. I didn't think too much of it, but it did occur to me that, that we all seem to think or just assume that it's obvious that time exists and that all this motion and change is happening over or in or with or through or because of a thing called time or, or perhaps as time passes while it, it's all happening. But we seem to just assume that. And Sherlock Holmes said it's often a mistake to accept something as true merely because it's obvious. So I wonder what does over time mean? And I started researching it. I found this quote by Albert Einstein. For we convince physicists the distinction between past, present and future is only an illusion, however persistent. So he called time a persistent illusion. He actually wrote this uh, quote, it comes from a letter that he wrote to the widow of his best friend Martin Bezo, who was a fellow scientist and philosopher. And that was because with all the work Einstein was doing, in space and time, they seem to be merged together. And not only that, but it seemed that, that the distinction between the future and the past was very blurred. It was as if the future and the past all existed, and we were just kind of wandering between this, this one big block of time. But I think that it's a lot simpler than that. I think there is no real distinction between the past, the present, and the future, because the past and the future are misunderstandings. Not even illusions, just misunderstandings. If you think about it, there really can't be any illusions. Whatever you see is what you see. If you go and see a brilliant uh, magician, you're going to see what you're going to see. You're going to see exactly what happens on stage. You may misunderstand it, but that's slightly different. So I'm wondering if perhaps we misunderstand it. So I wonder what we really mean by the past and the future. I wonder what if things didn't exist, move and change over time, but what if things just move and change? You'll notice throughout these slides, I've got a lot of emphasis. I, I kind of want to emphasize every single word in them, but you have to be selective. The word here just, I've underlined it, I've put it in capitals, I've put it in italics, I've put it in bold, I've put it in a bigger font. So it's <laughs> emphasized, okay? That's it. I can put it in different languages as well, but that's why I'm going. What do I mean by just move and change? I mean only. I mean they just move and change. If I'm walking across here, am I heading into the future? and leaving the past behind me, or am I just walking over here? If you're walking to the pub, you're leaving your house behind you, whatever's happening in your house is happening there, and you're heading towards the pub, but whatever's happening in the pub is happening in the pub. So perhaps things all around the universe are just happening, and you head towards some things, and you head away from other things. So, I began reading, researching, thinking about time, and I found a few problems. These are some of the books that I read on time. These are specifically about time. A Brief History of Time, Time and Space Traveller, uh, tra Time Traveller in Four Dimensions, somewhere around here, Time Traveller in Einstein's Universe, The White Hole in Time, The Arrow of Time. This is actually Einstein's relativity. He, he produced a couple of versions of lately, but if you read it, it's not that hard, as long as you ignore the squiggly bits that look like equations, it's not going to be on there. I get the idea of roughly what they mean. So I, I began reading and watching a lot of programs and uh, listening to a lot of talks on the internet and stuff like that. And I found some problems because I had this idea that things just move and change and that would explain everything. And I found that all of these books seemed to just assume time existed or they had a couple of very basic proofs that could be shown to be wrong if you just kept focused and asking a few questions. And focus is the one thing. I can be very tenacious when I get an idea in my mind. And as I developed this, this, this conversation, this idea, I realised that nearly every conversation about time ends up, particularly for down the pub, in a massive distraction. You know what it's like down the pub, you've had a couple of drinks, have you ever had an argument about whether God exists in the pub? But you actually have an argument. Now that suggests that you really believe that one of you is going to say something that no one's mentioned in the last 2,000 years. And the papers locally will say tomorrow, local drunks find and prove the existence of God. You know, you get into that. And what I found with the conversation about time is because time is, is actually number one now in the English language, that conversation touches hundreds of subjects, thousands of subjects, and we tend to just go off on those subjects. We compare time to many other things. We, we think whatever is true about this subject is true about time. Whatever is true about time is true about this. And you always end up thinking that the conversation will never end, that there must be something there, it must be mysterious, and then if someone's around and, you know, if someone's off to get around, I'll always let them go rather than make my point. So we start thinking, we're thinking, you know, is there a God, is there a Buddha, do aliens exist, how did the universe start, how will the universe end, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, will it make a sound? I've been asked that so many times, but what's that got to do with time? Uh, who shot Kennedy? Um, who shot J.R.? 
You know, did we really go to the moon? Have we got a soul or a spirit? What happens when we die? If time exists and we went back and killed Hitler, could we stop World War II? If time exists and we went into the future, you know, could we get the lottery numbers and bring them back? All these questions arrive. But this conversation has to be about one thing, one thing only, time. And if we stick with it, and if I get this right, you will be able to leave here, hopefully, and look at the world differently. I mean that very seriously. You'll come out and perhaps you'll look at the world and go, wow, there really is no past and there really is no future. It's always just now. There never has been a past. There never will be a future. Of course, we have to answer some of the ancillary questions uh, as they arise, otherwise we get frustrated, you know, with loose ends. So, was of course Sue Ellen's sister, uh, Kristen, who shot J.R. Just in case anyone was worried about that. It's, I mean, was, I'm sure it was, no, it wasn't, it wasn't Bobby. No, Bobby was in the mask or whatever. So, what is time and why do we even think that it exists? Why do we assume that it exists? If you're like me, you probably didn't get the idea of time yourself. It probably came from your parents yelling bedtime and then pointing to a machine that they called a clock. So you get the idea from someone else or somewhere else. And that's very important because as a kid, you might chuck your toys out of the pram. And you'll notice that invariably they fall down onto a necessary helium balloon or something like that. You might play around with magnets and find that they stick to the fridge but not to your head. You might run through doorways without a problem, but when you try and run through a glass doorway, you bonk your head. So you learn about glass, magnetism, and gravity, and then countless other things without ever being told about them, without ever being given the name for them. Because these things clearly exist. They can be looked at, they can be measured, whatever. But with time, we seem to get the idea from our parents. We never go up to our parents and go, Mom, I was just wondering, is there an invisible, intangible thing called time? that flows in a fourth dimension. You never say that. I didn't say that until I was five. So. <laughs> so they point to a clock, okay? But what is a clock? Let's start with that. What is a clock? Einstein famously said, we'll come to it further on, um, that time is that which clocks measure. So what are clocks measure? This is a, a toy clock or a kit clock that I've got at home. It's a very beautiful thing because at the beginning, if you look at it, it just looks very complicated. You can't really tell what's going on. There's a pendulum here at the back. This thing swings backwards and forwards and the hands obviously go around, that's what we expect. But with this clock, you can break it down. And that's really quite interesting. What you find out is that this is the main spring. At the back of the clock there, you stick a key in and there's a little ratchet and you can wind this spring up. When you wind it up, it just wants to unwind, but there's a ratchet locking it, so it can only unwind this way. Well, as it tries to unwind, it drives all these cogs all the way around to here. And it tries to unwind this cog very rapidly. But this cog is connected to this pendulum. As the pendulum swings backwards and forwards, it allows this cog to move on just one little kick, click. In return, that cog will give this pendulum a little kick so it can swing again. So this pendulum will keep swinging backwards at a very regular rate, allowing this cog here to unwind very slowly. That's all that this little system does. The other cogs merely display what this cog is doing a bit clearer. They send a signal out here, which drives the hour hand. Then the signal goes out and back out here, and it's slowed down and sped up, and it drives the other hand. So you put it all together, and we've learned a little bit. I found it quite interesting when you look at something, you have no idea what that was, and now I know how it works a little bit more. But it's still only a motorized bunch of cogs. What this machine really shows you is the release of energy from here, from inside something to the outside world, and it shows you that things can move. It shows you things can move and change, but it doesn't show you that there's a thing called the future, or a thing called the past, or a thing called time that flows between them. We just seem to assume that. But we've got other reasons for thinking time exists. Time is the number one now in the English language, isn't it? Mysteries of time. If you look up on Google, mysteries of time, you'll get about 53 million hits. If you look up time travel, you get a quarter of a billion hits. If you look up does time exist, you'll get about half a billion hits. So people really think time might be something, it might be mysterious, we might be able to travel through. I should explain to you that half my friends think that it's obvious time exists, and the other half think that it's obvious time doesn't exist. So they both thought there was no point writing a book. I never managed to really get them in a room and have a fight. So by a show of hands, so there are three kind of basic views you can have here, that time definitely exists in some way, definitely doesn't or you're not quite sure. So let's go with the let's go with the not quite sure's first of all. Anyone's go, yeah, okay, da 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 okay. 
that's about a third. How many? Uh, you're, you're not sure if you're not quite sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, about it. Yeah. That's fine. That's why you're here. I mean, because I'm quite sincere. I, I really think that I've cracked this, which is a grand statement to make. But also, I realise that I might be wrong. You know, to be scientific, you can't be dogmatic. You, you've got a, a position, and you're trying to argue it. Well, not exactly argue it. You're trying to prove it. You know, if you argue, you're just like a politician, all you ever really end up proving is who's a better arguer. How many people here think time definitely does exist? No one at all. Excellent. This should be easy. We'll be out here early. How many people here think time does not exist? Okay. So, all right. So we've got about a quarter think it doesn't. A third think it might or might not, and no one thinks it does. Good, that's clear. Let's, let's progress. I'll clear all this confusion up, because there is a lot of confusion. All those books that I showed you, they all kind of agree and disagree. I don't know if you saw it was a program by um, Brian Cox, who I think is a great guy. He's doing a great uh, a lot of publicity for science, making it really interesting. He did a program called What Time Is It? And they had like five or ten experts, and they all kind of disagreed and they disagreed in different ways about what time is, and so on and so on. So, there's confusion. In simple terms, to define what we mean by time, we say that time consists of the past, the present, and the future. Time is said to flow from the future through the present into the past in a one-way direction. A part of saying that suggests that the present is an infinitely thin moment. And you'll even see people talk about what's the smallest amount of time we can measure. Is it an attosecond? Is it a nanosecond? And I think when people are measuring things like that, they're really just measuring uh, the, the distance or the speed that something vibrates. They're not proving there's a past and future. If there is a past and future, then this present moment is this incredibly rapidly changing thing. And we can't see the past because it, it, as soon as it exists, it disappears. We can't see the future until it just has arrived and disappeared. And, and that's very much like the, the Emperor's New Road. You know, the proof that it exists is that you can't see it. I got on some internet forum discussion group about this, and I really pressed the guy on whether the time existed, uh, whether the past existed, and he ended up saying, it did exist, but it doesn't now. <laughs> just like... So when did it exist if it never exists? But anyway, so whatever. I, I, I've got into arguments about this before now. I had a, an argument with a, a guy who had a PhD in philosophy or whatever, and he ended up saying, so what do you think, what do you think John Paul Sartre would have said about that? And I said, I have no idea, I'm not really into music, and it just kind of went off from there, right? So, so we say the past exists or existed because Things clearly happen. I'm not denying that things happen. That would be ridiculous. Dinosaurs clearly rode rode ro ro the earth, you know, at, in a sense. But I'm asking whether or not that's recorded. But we say the past exists because things clearly happen and have clearly happened that are not happening now. And this is an example of something that that used to happen now and again. It's Britain or England winning a major football tournament doesn't happen anymore. But we all remember that it clearly used to happen. Then we can remember these events. These are a couple of people remembering. I just keyed into the internet, people remembering, and that's a picture that I got. For some reason, they look German or Swiss. I think they were in ski boots, but whatever. We say the present exists because we can constantly see it. And this is some people constantly seeing the present. <laughs> this guy is my hero because he's the only one who bothered to actually bring a ladder so at some point you can have a look inside the present and really see what it was. So that's me. We say the future exists because we know things will happen that are not happening now. So we say that we know it's, it's, there's going to be some weather tomorrow, but we don't know what it's going to be. But there'll be some, it'll be sunny or rainy, or the sun will explode and burn us, or something's going to happen tomorrow. We could get the lottery and we, we don't know if we're going to win it. Apparently it's a future event, whether or not we're going to win it. But with certain things, sadly, they're fairly predictable. Tax bills and death and whatever. Same time has a flow and a direction because we're born, we live, and we die. It's a very rare picture of Einstein as a baby. Very lucky to get that. Uh, this is people living. Uh, Sam is the only picture I can find on the internet <laughs> as an example, which is the ladies' volleyball, beach volleyball here in the London Olympics, which is what are they going to have next? The ladies' pole dancing Olympics. And, so, and it's, it's very unfortunate, but for some reason, they have to get these signs behind their backs, and the camera has to zoom in, and you're like, is this really the Olympics? Uh, and we die, so whatever. And we say that we can remember the past, but not the future. This is quite a poignant thing, remembering the past, not the future. A lot of books, including Brief History of Time, are based on that saying as their proof or definition that it's obvious time exists. And I think this can be taken apart. 
So what do the experts think? Uh, this is an expert from The Simpsons. I don't know if you ever saw that episode where they were wondering whether there was a mysterious third dimension to the universe. Because of course they're two-dimensional characters. What do the experts actually prove? Well, this is Stephen Hawking who wrote The Brief History of Time. And if you bought it, it's an excellent book. But technically you can, you can sue them because it doesn't actually really give you a history of time. It does give you a history or a, a, a description of the universe and cosmology. It's a brilliant book. It explains a lot of things in great detail. But it doesn't really have a history of time. So this, for your money, is a real brief history of time. It starts with Galileo, Galilee, Figaro Magnifico, I'm just a poor boy, to give him his full name. <laughs> Stephen Hawking says, Galileo, perhaps more than any other single person, was responsible for the birth of modern science. Now, we don't really know if he was single. Um, there's no real story of him getting married. That's his own <laughs> business, as long as his maths work. But for me, he was probably the founder of the idea that time is real or tangible. <clears throat> the reason Stephen Hawking says Galileo is probably the founder of modern science is because Galileo started measuring things. He started actually doing experiments. When he was around, everyone thought you could work things out just by sitting down. So they assumed that if you dropped a heavy object and a light object, a heavy object would obviously fall faster than a light object. That kind of seems to make sense, because if you're a kid and you pick up a heavy thing, you pick up a light thing, where's well, it's easier to pick up a, a, a light thing. But he started doing experiments. Story goes that he was in his uh, local church or Sistine Chapel, or wherever it was, he was looking at the, the incense burners or lanterns swinging uh, from the church roof, and he ended up comparing them to his own pulse. Now, unless there was like a major uh, car chase or something happening in the chapel, your pulse is going to be fairly regular. I don't know how often you go to church, but I very rarely got extremely excited about it. Um, and what he realised was that when you set a pendulum swinging, it will have a large arc at the beginning. That arc will reduce because of wind resistance, air resistance. But it might have taken, say, four pulses for this pendulum to complete its arc. But even as it reduced, it still took four pulses. And sometimes things just inspire you. think, that's really weird. I would have thought that would, would either have sped up as it got smaller, or it would have slowed down as it got smaller, but it turns out it's the same thing. So he went away and he really thought about that and he started doing experiments. His experiments involve pendulums, and these are quite amazing things because out in the middle of nowhere you can just get a, a piece of string and a weight and tie it around a, a rafter and, and make sure there are any drafts, and you can make the string longer and you can make it thinner and you can make the weight heavier, and you can keep on improving this thing until you get an excellent pendulum. If you've ever been to the Science Museum, they've got I think it's called a focal pendulum, something like that, excuse my language. And it, it's, it stretches for like six stories. They set it swinging in the morning and it will swing all day. It will even show you how the earth is spinning because the pendulum swings on its own. But he also worked with a clepsydra, or water clock. So this is a container that you put water in. And as you're running an experiment, you put your finger over the nozzle here. You release your finger as the experiment starts and then you put your finger back over as it stops. And what happens is you will collect an amount of water. So without a, a digital clock or a wind-up clock or any other kind of clock, you can actually make very accurate measurements of what we would call time. He wouldn't have collected it in a glass, so I'll just put that there to show you that that's uh, some water being collected. But nonetheless, at the end of the experiment, you can weigh the amount of water. And you can do that with as much care as you want. So that way, <coughs> that way, excuse the pun, you can create very accurate measurements, again, of what we would call time. One of the things he did was he, he worked with uh, gently sloping ramps. This isn't actually one of his, but I think it's a replica or another version. And the thing is that if you chuck an object off you know, a tall building, or it, it will fall very rapidly. It's very hard to tell where that object is. You, you can only really make a measurement of, of it being released and it hitting the ground. But when you make a, a gently inclined ramp like this, it's as if something was falling, but the whole process is slowed down. If you can imagine if this was even more gently inclined, it would be slowed down even more. And on this ramp, he's got a series of bells here. You can see them here. As a ball rolls down this ramp here, it will hit this little lever and it'll make this little bell team. So that means you can tell by listening precisely where this bell is. And you can set up your water clock, you can measure uh, how much water you collected as the ball rolled from here to here, and then how much water you collected as it rolled down the second half of the ground. And you might expect those amounts of water to be the same, but you'd find that they were, they were different because the ball accelerates. So he started doing very meaningful, very useful uh, experiments, and he ended up creating equations 
This equation here, if you stick in a value for time here, say three as in three seconds, out here, it will give you a distance that an object will fall in three seconds. If you key in here a distance that you want an object to fall, it will tell you how long in seconds it will take to fall. So all of this, this t being time, seems to prove that time is real and measurable and tangible. But if you think about it, Galileo never proved there was a future. And he never proved there was a past. And he never proved there was a thing called time that flowed between them. All he really proved was that balls can roll down ramps and water can grab spouts and you can collect them and you can compare them. But it seemed to be useful. Now, also, as he was doing this, he would have been counting, most probably, I don't know, I didn't go back and check, right? But when he's doing something like that, when you spend, send a, a pendulum swing, you end up counting one, two, three, four, five. Fairly innocent things to do. But think about it. We talk about dimensions, and they're quite a useful idea, up, down, left, right, forwards, backwards. The idea originated from a mathematician whose name escapes me at the moment. Apparently he was ill and he was in bed, and he was watching a fly buzzing around in the corner of his room. And he realised that just with three numbers he could lock down the position of that fly to just exactly one and only one position. That's the idea of dimension. Just an idea, but it makes a lot of sense. But when you do this thing, when you start counting one, two, three, four, five, there's a problem. Because we get the idea that there's some other thing spanning, heading constantly forwards in a direction that isn't up, down, left, or right. We can start calling it a dimension. We can start doing maths with it, and the maths works. So what I'm trying to show you is that there's this trail of things that are more and more interesting, more and more useful, but no one's checking the most basic facts. <coughs> Isaac Newton found a class mechanics, classical mechanics <coughs> excuse me, on the view that time is something that passes uniformly, that is smoothly and regularly. For this reason he spoke of absolute space and absolute time. Fixed and rigid space and fixed and rigid time. The two things weren't necessarily connected and time seems to just pass constantly at a steady rate. Einstein went on to change these ideas. But the problem for me is that here he said time is something that passes uniformly. The question seems to be, does time pass uniformly or does it pass at different rates, you know, depending on the time of day or the time of year or whatever, whether you're near a heavy object. So in a sense here, in my opinion, he swallows the hook. He's saying, what is time? And he hasn't proved that time exists. He seems to have just assumed it. I haven't read anything that says that Newton proved that there was a future or a past or a flow of time between them. And Newton went on to, of course, to do his own tremendously useful uh, um, equations. You know, they, they use these equations to go to the moon. They worked out why planets orbit, you know, wonderful stuff. He worked out that the moon is constantly falling towards the Earth, just missing it. That was close. So that brings us to a guy called John Harrison. If you read a book here, Longitude by uh, David Sobel, this guy started making clocks. He made them for the Royal Navy because there was a, a kind of decree, there was a big prize going out. At the time, the Royal Navy said, if we know what time it is out at sea, we can tell where we are. So there was a massive prize, you know, equivalent of millions of pounds a day, for anyone who could build a very accurate clock. And the clock has to be very accurate. If it's out by five minutes a day, it, you can't tell where you are in the ocean. You lose more and more accuracy where you are in the ocean. And people go out to the ocean and starve to death because they didn't know where they were. They, they took the wrong heading. So it's sort of a matter of life and death. And this is the kind of clock he created, very complicated, wonderful machines. The problem they were trying to solve is the problem of longitude. Your latitude, your distance around the Earth this way, can be worked out quite easily. You can look at the angle to the sun, or you can look at the angle to the stars, and you can pretty much work out how far up or down the Earth you are, very easily indeed. But the Earth is constantly rotating, so if you're out of the ocean, all you can see is water around you. And you can see the sun or the stars, but that doesn't help you because you don't know where you are. If you knew the time, so it is said, at Greenwich, then you could look at the sun when it's directly overhead where you are, and you could work out how many degrees around the Earth from Greenwich you are. An extremely useful thing. Hence it was said that one needed to know the right time if at sea. But consider this. Harrison produced these wonderful machines, these, these clocks, with wonderful dials, which we, of course, would say tell us the time. How did he check the accuracy of his machines? How did he check the accuracy of the clock? He hadn't got an accurate clock to check it against. Well, what he did was he sat in his garden at midnight, and he would see a particular star go behind his neighbor's chimney. Then he would start his clock off, 
And then the next day at midnight again, you can see that star pass the chimney and you can see where his clock was, if it was fast or slow by how many minutes a day. So what he was really doing was producing a machine that, that monitored or, or tried to uh, mimic the rotation of the Earth. So consider this. The British Navy would have been completely happy, in my opinion, I think, if you had produced something like this for them. This represents the sun, just a stick with a light on the end, or just an orange ball. And this is a globe that rotates at the same rate that the Earth rotates. It doesn't tell you the time, it just spins at the same rate. If you had such a device, you could work out where you are. You could be out in the middle of the ocean, you could look at the angles of the sun, you could look at this thing, which is as if you were out in space looking down at the Earth or whatever, and you say, well, if the angle of the sun is, you know, seven and a half degrees, then, you know, we must be here. Because if it was a, a lesser or greater angle, we would have to be up here or down here. So all a clock really does is mimic the rotation of the Earth. This is a 24-hour watch that I've got at home. This hand here goes round the dial once every 24 hours. Or in other words, it goes round at the same rate that the Earth spins. If you put this watch on the ground, this little red hand here constantly points to the sun. I've done it. I'm single. I haven't got a life. <laughs> Henri Ponquier, uh, he was a philosopher, so there's a lot of philosophy, a lot of thinking and science all mixed up together here. He said the notion of time is relatively clear. We distinguish without difficulty present sensation from the remembrance of past sensations or the anticipation of future sensations. But I think this is wrong. Let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to ask them a question here. They will know the answer, or at least they should, but the answer is in this room. It's about them, but it's in the room. So, sir, if you don't mind, uh, what's your name? Brad. Brad. Excuse me. Question, Brad, is this. What is the name of the first school that you went to? Scarfell. 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 Have I got that right? S-C-A-R-T-H-O. Scarfell. Scarfell. Right, Scarfell. It's oh, an odd name for school. Where's that? Uh, right in the north. Okay, Scarfell. Yeah. Yeah. Got a broken leg? No, I got a scarf um, I should actually say scarf though. That's why I didn't understand. Why do you say <laughs> scarf right? <laughs> so, when I ask you that question about the first school you went to, scarf scarf um, you find the answer in your head. But you may think, and most of us might assume, that you were talking about the past. And normally we look at our memories in our head and we call them memories and memories of the past. So that must mean the past exists and the past must exist and that's why we've got memories. But in actual fact, all you've really proved is that you walked in here with a head full of memories. You know, when you were at that school, someone could have scribbled it down for you and stuck it in your pocket and you might have never taken it out of your pocket. And all it shows you is that a piece of paper can be moved from that area to here. It doesn't, the contents of your mind, prove that things move and change. But it's a bit of a leap to say that they also prove there is a fourth dimension to the universe and that as we move around the world, there's a perfect record of every event created and stored in a place called the past. But we make that assumption. We make that assumption without even thinking or realising that we made that assumption most of the time. It seems so obvious the past exists. You know, we're bigger now than we were in the past. We've got clothes that won't fit us now that did in the past. But I can say my keys are in the pocket, but if I say World War II is in the past, do I really mean the past exists and World War II is a thing in it? Obviously I don't, but we just use that expression, the past. If I, we start talking about the magic of Harry Potter, you can see that I'm misusing the word the, unless I prove <laughs> that Harry Potter is magic. I can talk about the fictitious magic of Harry Potter, and that would be a lot safer. Sorry if that's ruined anyone's illusions then. <laughs> and I can talk about the idea of the past. And don't get me wrong, time is an extremely useful system. It works. I'm not saying we shouldn't use it. I'm questioning whether it actually really exists or not. And what I'm trying to say is that I think I can show very clearly that it absolutely does not exist at all. And instead, all that exists is what you see around you. A present moment that is constantly moving and changing and interacting. And the question is, if things in the world can just move and change and interact, would that be enough to give us the illusion or the misunderstanding that there might be a thing called time? This guy here says we distinguish our uh, difficulty present sensation from remembrance of the past, anticipation of the future. 
what he calls the remembrance of the past might just be looking at something inside your head. That's like just looking at something inside a book. What about the future? If I said to you guys, right, what if we had uh, an elephant here, and I had a dart, right, and I had the dart here, right, how, hands up, how many people here think I could hit that elephant with the dart? One, two, three, four, five, okay. How many people think I couldn't hit the elephant with the dart? None. So you all think I can hit the elephant with the dart in the future, if there was an elephant here, and if I had a dart, I'd chuck it. Well, I'm going to break this to you, we didn't have the budget. <laughs> we couldn't afford a dart. <laughs> the elephant's back there, it's got to do, it's everything laid out it's hard. My point is this, with that example, it's obvious that you're not anticipating the future. If I had a dartboard up here, you might think you were anticipating the future. But all you're really doing is constructing something in your head. I can ask you to imagine a, a baboon on a trampoline, and you can construct a thing in your head and imagine how it may work. That's a brilliant thing. But it doesn't prove that there's a future that you've either correctly or incorrectly anticipated or predicted. So perhaps this thing here is, is a bit of a conclusion jumping exercise. You know, Remember some past, you're just looking in your head at something that is there physically. Anticipation of the future, you're just constructing a model and you're calling it anticipation of the future, but you haven't proved scientifically there's a past and the future. Then Albert Einstein came along, and don't get me wrong, I'm not disagreeing with what these people worked out, the essence of it and the usefulness of it, but I'm saying it's a different way of interpreting it. Einstein, clearly a genius, and then, you know, I, I agree completely with virtually everything he said, but I don't think it's about time, I think it's about the way things move. But he came along with special relativity, and he said, moving clocks run slow. He also said, time is that which clocks measure. But as far as I can tell, he didn't prove that bit. But here's the thing. Einstein came up with a thought experiment, an idea called a light clock. You imagine a wooden box with two mirrors in it that are opposing each other. And in between those mirrors, you have a photon bouncing up and down. Now, light is the fastest thing in the universe. Why is it the fastest thing in the universe? Because if anyone was faster, we'd use that instead. He concluded that light was the fastest thing in the universe for a number of reasons. One is that we don't seem to see any instantaneous reactions. You can't do something here that instantly affects something over there. A single quantum entanglement, that's slightly different. Um, so this is the fastest thing in the universe. Einstein wondered as a kid, if you had a mirror in front of you and, and you could see your reflection, what would happen if you started accelerating faster and faster? What if you approached the speed of light? Surely the light from your face wouldn't be able to catch up with the mirror and the image would start to fade. And it was thinking like that that drove him mental. No, it wasn't him. It was thinking like that that led him to realise that the various other effects would come into play. Things he called time dilation and length, length contraction, various things. But here's the point. You get a box like this, you can call this a clock. This thing ticks up and down at great speed and this is the most pure thing you can use as a mechanism in your clock. So if you put a counter up here, that counter would tick round. But if you get this clock and you move it along at great speed in one direction, the problem is, or the, the thing it reveals, is that this photon now has to travel in a diagonal to hit these mirrors. But it can't go faster than it can go. So as this one goes tick, tick, this one just makes one tick and it's heading for its second tick. So this machine, if you had a counter on the top, top, would run slower than the counter on that one. Not only that, but if you sat on this one here, you had an identical twin that sat on this one, as it whizzed away at great speed, everything about that identical twin would change more slowly. If they went far enough away and they came back to you, <coughs> you might look as if you'd aged 10 years, and they might look as if they'd only aged 5, and it would be a very genuine effect, right down to every last molecule or atom or subatomic particle, particle in their body. So moving objects do change more slowly. <coughs> but everyone assumed that this meant there was a thing called time that passed more slowly. What this means, if you drag it out to this conclusion, you've got a stationary clock, this one runs slow. If you can get one to move at close to the speed of light, you can see this photon is spending all of its motion trying to catch up with the mirrors. So if it was trapped between here, it would just be bouncing up down very slowly. That's why you hear the idea that if you could travel at the speed of light, time would stand still. What I would suggest is that if you could travel at the speed of light, you wouldn't change. It's a big difference between suggesting there's a thing called time that would stop. You also hear that if you could go fast in the speed of light, you'd go backwards in time. 
to me, that, that drives me mad because no one's proved there's a future or a past or a thing called time, and they're making this massive extrapolation. And you've got to be careful about following mathematics too far. <laughs> if I was to ask you, no laughing in the class, if I was to ask you, Matt, oh, here's a question for you. If you had a pen with two sheep in it, two sheep, and you took three sheep out of that pen, how many sheep would you be left with? Sorry, you couldn't do it. Mathematically, the answer is minus one sheep. You know, and if you can get a pen with minus one sheep, you can sell tickets. So you've got to be careful about following the mathematics. Um, so, if I go to pause there. So then, Lithuanian mathematician Hermann Minkowski read special relativity, and he said, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadow. This is because what Einstein's work seemed to show was there was a, a blurring and immersion between space and time. And so Minkowski said, yeah, this, this looks like you know, space-time. And thus the idea of four-dimensional space-time was born. And Einstein read that and he was pleased with that. And then he wrote general relativity, which is a more, it covers more subjects than special relativity. General relativity says that gravity will slow time down. And it's true that gravity will slow a clock down, it will slow any change down, but that still hasn't proved the future and the past exists. Then along came Stephen Hawking. He looked at general relativity and various other things, and he said that means that areas of space and time might be linked by wormholes. You might be able to dive into some massive object in space and come out not just in another part of space, but in a different time, in the past or the future. This is what the equations seem to show him. He said at the end of one of his lectures, the conclusion of this lecture, sadly it's not this lecture, anyone who wanted to leave early, um, is that rapid space travel or travel back in time can't be ruled out. Travel back in time. He's not saying time does not exist, it's just a useful idea, but let's pretend it does. He's saying what he believes is that time seems to be so real we might be able to theoretically travel through it. So all these guys, and the fact all these books and all these TV shows seem to think that time is real and complicated and mysterious in many different ways. And so I'm going to try and show you where they got it wrong and how time does not exist at all. And it's not a bluff, it's very serious. Here's the problem. Virtually all of the stuff that I've read and seen on time starts by either just assuming time obviously exists or by asking does time exist or by asking what is time. Now these are leading questions. If I ask you, what is voodoo? You know, does voodoo exist? Can voodoo operate over large distances or just small distances? I'm leading the conversation on. I'm making an assumption. If you're a kid and you assume that the tooth fairy exists, you're going to get a lot of evidence that will seem to confirm it. If the tooth fairy exists, that will, will explain why your teeth disappear when you leave them under the pillow, why the money is returned there. It'll explain how this is done even though you live on the 20th floor or not of a, a housing estate, because obviously only a fairy can get to that kind of height and get in even though you've got the window to check. Kids do check things. My mate, um, at Christmas time, he wanted to see if Santa Claus really existed, so he put the, the stocking at the end of his bed and tied a piece of string around it to his toe. <laughs> It's a brilliant idea. So they make that assumption that time exists or what is time. But I'm saying, let's start with a clear mind. Imagine you went to a village where there were hundreds of villagers who all believed in voodoo and they all seemed to have stories that concurred and, and the evidence from their own experience or friends' experience or whatever. And it seemed there was so much evidence that voodoo exist, existed. If you got all those people and you line them up together in a big queue and you tried to explain to each one why it didn't exist in their particular case, should be there forever. What would be better is if you said, right, let's just stop. Let's not make any assumptions. Let's get your voodoo guy. We'll stick him in a booth. We'll get someone over there that doesn't know, he hasn't seen. We'll give him some wax. We'll give him some pins. We'll see whether he can affect this person. We'll try it at different distances. Then you can see what does exist. You observe what does exist. Making an assumption and seeing if you can disprove it can be very risky. So we clear our minds, what do we actually see? Well, I think we see things existing, moving, again, sad, the only picture I can find on the internet, very limited, and interacting. This is a very important thing, things interact. The reason you have the name of that ridiculous school in your head is because things interact. You know, you see the school sign, then someone who can read up north tells you what it says, and you remember it, and then the contents of your mind change. 
patronise you there. Patronise me to I talk down to someone as if they can't understand it. That's a joke. <laughs> so we see things existing, moving, and interacting. That's what we see. The question is: there, Is there an extra thing? Is there another thing called time? You know, maybe there is. Maybe there isn't. There are a lot of things out there that are invisible. I mean, we don't see the air, but we see its effects. We don't see magnetism. We don't see gravity. Just because something's invisible doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So this leads to the key or the critical question, which is this. What if things in the world just exist and move and interact? I've underlined it, put it in capitals, put it in a bigger font, put it in italics and put it in bold. What if they just move and interact? <coughs> well, this explains everything that we think proves time exists. So we apply this question to the past, the present and the future. <coughs> this is the most basic example of the question I could come up with. If we place an object on a table, and then we take that object completely away, you can't see it anymore, but we all kind of know it was there. If I put this glass here, you can see the glass here, and then I take the glass away, and everyone here would agree, yes, we remember, we saw the glass on the X. Now what does that prove and what it doesn't prove? What doesn't it prove? What it does prove is that the glass exists and that light can hit the glass, and it can bounce off the glass in all directions. It can hit your lens. Your lens is a phenomenal thing. It grabs all this light, it refocuses it onto your retina, it makes an image of the glass. Sadly, you never actually see the glass. You only see an image in the back of your eye, that's a different illusion. <laughs> it's, a, it's an amazing thing, the illusion of vision, because we walk around the world and all we ever see is the back of our eye. We think we can see through windows, and we cannot. All we can see is the light coming in through a window. We never see out of a window. It's an astonishing thing, you know, you can go through your whole life not realising that. But it's a perfect illusion. It works consistently. It's constantly maintained. It's similar in the way to, to time, if I'm right about this. So that image is on the back of your eye. Incredible the electrochemical processes send a signal down your optic nerve into your brain and it changes the contents of your brain. So it proves that things can exist and move and change and interact. But it doesn't prove there's a future or a past. It just proves that the contents of your mind can form an image. Your mind might as well be a digital camera. All you've done is rearrange some of the matter or electrons inside there. But it seems to be proof of the past. Now here's the thing, we have a lot of things that seem to be proof of the past. It's as if they were maps proving a territory exists. But you can have a map, and it's very useful if the territory exists, but a map does not prove that the territory exists. And if anyone doesn't believe me, see me after the show, I've got some land that I'm going to sell you at a very cheap rate. <laughs> it's massive, it's really worth it, it's a beautiful place. For this to be valid and useful, the territory has to actually exist. If I said I've got 500 maps of it, and I've got 1,000, I've got 20, it doesn't matter how many maps I've got, that still doesn't necessarily prove that the territory exists. In the world, we have our internal memories, and we have other records of maps that seem to be of the past. And one of the problems is that our memories will concur. They will concur with each other. If I ask you all, was there a glass here on the next, you will say yes. They would also concur with physical evidence. You know, if I drop this glass and it breaks, everyone will say, I remember it breaking in the past. And there's the glass here. The two things concur. That proves the past exists. But it doesn't. It just proves things move and change and interact. So all of these things, just prove that matter can interact. Once we make a videotape, or we find a fossil, or we, we write or buy a book, or a painting, or a photograph, or whatever, we tend to leave it somewhere where there's not much energy. We tend to leave it somewhere where it won't get destroyed. If I said, I've just bought this Rambart, Ram, Rambart, Rembrandt, could you please store it in the fireplace for me? That would be you know, kind of nonsensical, you know, I don't want to do that again. So, Things can move and change, they can change at different rates. You know, this is an animal, but clearly it went into an ocean bed or whatever and it died. And then its bones got replaced by some magical, mysterious, wonderful process um, and became solidified. So I'm not denying this thing existed or run around or it got changed. But of course, all the matter that made up this trilobite is always just somewhere doing something. It would be very hard to take a photograph of all the matter that made up this trilobite, but it's all somewhere, it's just spread out. It's a bit like you know, when you smoke a cigarette, it doesn't disappear, it just spreads out. You shouldn't get the two things confused. It's, it never disappears into the past or, or comes out of the future. 
So if we want to see how the universe may be timeless, we must ask, does the past actually exist? Does it really actually exist? Is there a temporal record of events somewhere, or is there not a temporal record of events, temporal, time-based? What do I mean by that? Well, as we move and walk around the world, does the universe make a recording of it? If so, where? Why? How? What is that recording stored on? How many gigabytes of memory does it take up? Even if the universe did create a perfect record of all events in a place or thing called the past, how would you or I know? Because we know, for example, that when we think we're talking about the past, we're actually looking at the contents of our head. Even if there is a record of the past, we don't go back and check it. So I think that's a, a seemingly tiny detail that people have overlooked that has massive consequences. And I would suggest that there isn't. There's no reason to believe there's a temporal past, and there's no proof. If you want to believe something scientifically, you need a good reason to suspect it, and then some kind of experiment that people can do all over the world that prove it. And as far as I've seen, all experiments only ever prove that things can exist and move and interact. People sometimes say to me, you know, what is your theory? You've got a theory about time or timelessness. And I say, no, not really. I'm just saying the world is as it appears to be. Things exist and move and change and interact. If you think there's an extra thing called time that has a future and a past and passes as we move or is needed for us to move, you're making a lot of claims and you've got the theory and you have to start proving them. So I say there's no real reason to suspect or prove that there is a past. So what about the present? Things move, they change. Surely they take time to move. Well, consider this. We say things take time to move, but what do we really mean and what do we really see? We say a car does 100 miles per hour. What we really see is that a car moves. We know cars exist, we know distances exist, um, but we express it in miles per hour, and that seems to tie the, the three things together. And, and often when three things are tied together, that's a very good reason to think that we're on the right track to seem to happen in, in nature. So it looks like we're all set to go. We've got a speedo in the car that tells us we're doing 100 miles an hour, and everyone would agree, and if you get stopped by the police, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but all we actually observe is that a car moves, and that some machine gives us a number but where does this number come from? Well, one way or another, in your car, it's monitoring the speed that the wheel's are going around, and it's monitoring the speed that some kind of a clock is going around, and it's comparing the two of them, and it's coming up with a number. That's what it's actually doing. It so happens, if you stretch this out to the simplest kind of example, it so happens that as a car moves 100 miles, a point on the equator would move about 1,000 miles, if you're doing 100 miles per hour, as we explain it. The Earth rotates 15 degrees per hour, just because we've said an hour is, is 1 24th of a rotation. Because if you ever went out in space and looked at the Earth, you'd never see it start and stop a rotation. It's just constantly rotating. This means that if you're on holiday and you're on a desert island somewhere, and you make text you and go, how are you? You relax, you relax, I'm doing a thousand miles an hour, I can't relax. It also means Someone can phone you up or text you and say, you know, I've got for speeding. And you can say, how fast were you going? And they can say, well, I was doing a, a tenth the speed of a point on the equator. And you can say, you idiot, you know the speed limit is a twentieth the speed of a point on the equator. And it's very clumsy language, but what it means is I can tell you exactly how fast I'm going without using distances or time. I'm trying to show you there's a kind of a, a magic trick or a con trick. You know when people swap things around three or four times and suddenly something seems to disappear or something seems to appear? And with this shuffling, we call 15 degrees of rotation an hour. Then we say that this car will take an hour to get to Birmingham. When you say to people, really? Where does it take this hour from? They go, oh, that would be ridiculous. You're talking semantics now. Go, yeah, I am talking semantics. You're the one with the semantics. Unless you can show this thing exists. We call one thing two different names, and then we claim two things exist, or they're the same thing. It's kind of jiggery poetry. So we can say that the car travels one tenth the speed of the equator, but what's the difference between miles per hour, one tenth the speed of a point in the equator? And it's not semantics. Mixture of words, confusion, rhetoric, the arc of the orator. Miles per hour suggests that miles and hours exist. This implies time exists, which implies time is needed or passes as things move, and time suggests the past and the future exist. So we start off thinking, oh yeah, the past and the future exist, maybe they do, maybe they don't then this seems to confirm it. And as this seems to confirm it, this seems to prove that these exist. Everything seems to back itself up. It's almost like having three people all confirm they think voodoo exists, you know. Miles and hours exist is implied. And miles kind of exist. 
you know, we can look at distance. We go, oh yeah, space and time. Some people always talk about space and time together. And I, why don't you talk about space and tooth fairy, or, or the tooth fairy in voodoo, or the tooth fairy in time? You know, why do you mix these things up? There are scientific reasons why it kind of makes sense. But the problem is that the miles seem to be an, an arbitrary unit of measurement. An hour seems to be an arbitrary unit of measurement. I think the difference is that miles are an arbitrary unit of something that really does exist. An hour is an arbitrary unit of something that might not exist. If I talk about magic columns and I say these are the units I've, I've invented to talk about the strength of Harry Potter spells, it's an arbitrary unit, but that doesn't mean that the thing exists. If you just say one tenth the speed of a point in the equator, this suggests that things can exist, the car and the earth. It suggests that things can move, and it suggests we can compare the speeds of different things. People say, oh, but for speed, you need to have time. I'm trying to show you how you untangle that. You can't just get your assumption. You can't get your conclusion and feed it in at the beginning of the equation. If ghosts exist, then ghosts exist. <laughs> so therefore, ghosts exist, which means that our first assumption, if they exist, is correct. Which means that you see what I mean? You can't do that. It's, it's invalid logic. So all it proves is that we compare the speeds of different things. You say in bulk, you know, you did 100 meters in under 10 seconds. What do we really mean? Really, we mean that as you did 100 meters, the Earth rotated, you know, a quarter of whatever degree. But to make it easy to understand, we made a machine that shows that rotation speed it up 70,000 times. He ran 100 meters while this pointy thing here did 100 millimeters. That's all that really happened. <laughs> so all we have observed is that various things are moving, that we can compare them if we choose to do that. Do it or not, it's up to you, but it doesn't prove there's a future, doesn't prove there's a past, doesn't prove there's a single time frame between them. What about the future? That seems to make sense. Surely we're going to die, we're going to pay tax, maybe it'll rain. This lecture should end at some point, please God. <laughs> if you go down your local park, you might see a lot of different examples of motion. Things going up and down, swinging backwards and forwards, going round and round, coasting along, clouds appearing or disappearing in the sky, drifting in and out. And you might think you're seeing the future constantly arriving, but you're not. You're just seeing stuff that's here now constantly changing in many different ways. And some things will come into your field of vision, and some things will go out of your field of vision. We may all feel that we've only just met each other, but all that's really happened, I mean, I live in North London, I know where you live, it's probably only a few miles away. There's been a lot of objects in the way. I couldn't hear you talking, I'm sorry, I wasn't being rude. But we were always, been some distance away from each other. Even if I die and fall apart, the things that make me up are always some distance away from you. Things move and change, but nothing comes out of the future. Nothing goes into the past. Those things don't exist, in my opinion. So what does happen? What do we see as the future? Well, we see energy being released. Typically, it's released from inside, something to the outside. When you buy a candle, it's phenomenal. You buy a stick of light. You go down the shop, you can have a stick of light. I want it in the same form that I can carry. They think you're mad. It's the same stuff that comes out of these things here, the same stuff that's coming out of this laser pointer. When you buy a firework rocket, there's a lot of energy in there that comes out very quickly. That's all. Just a candle upside down, burning very quickly. When you buy a drag car, this is a, a very nice drag car here, um, there's energy in the fuel that comes out from inside to the outside. Energy is released from inside of outside objects in simple terms. You can get a balloon when you release the energy. Sometimes they fly around very chaotically. Sometimes they fly around very linearly. Sometimes they burst. It's funny when you get a balloon and you hand it to someone, you're giving them a bang. There's a bang in there. But you can only use it once, but you can let it out. It's just like a big bang, and it was like a bang there. So things move and change in orderly or chaotic ways, but if we have this framework of time, we, we keep imposing this framework on what we see, we will call that a predictable or unpredictable future. A leaf can fall from a tree, and we, we can't really work out where it's landing, where it's heading. But the earth is constantly spinning and it's going around the sun, so we can do what we what we call predictions of sunsets and sunrises and eclipses, extreme accuracy. That's just because we're looking at a very heavy object that's got a tremendous amount of momentum, not very much affecting where it goes. Imagine this. We say that the, the present affects the future. I always find that really odd because you know, how does it do it? How does it just how does the past, does it push through this thin thing and affect the future? There must be an interaction. It, it, it's very odd because you, you kind of want to go, well, does the past affect the future? Or does the, the future constantly arrive? You know, everything seems so complicated. 
when you really work it out, and I was on a, a meditation course, I did a 10 day silent residential meditation, because I thought it would be better than sitting around the house doing nothing all the time. <laughs> be so wrong. 